What a beautiful song. Thank you, Brother Wolf, for sharing that. Um, of course, it's nerve-wracking standing up here. It's a little different than having to sing when you have to speak. So I'll ask everyone to please keep me in their prayers as I'll have to speak this morning. I am honored and both humbled by the opportunity to stand before you this morning to speak. Usually when you have to do a speech, if it's in your professional arena, it's not a big deal. You prepare slides, you prepare what you need to, and you're ready to present. But presenting God's word is a little more serious because God's business is serious business. Because our life is in the balance. It's a matter of life and death, eternal life or eternal death, and it depends which way you choose. So that's why it's critical and important that we approach God's words prayerfully. Um, I also wanted to extend my condolences to the church because we've just lost, lost Brother Taryn. And um, this morning as I was sitting here, I, I can imagine him, if I came to church Sabbath, we'd meet right there during fellowship time, and he would hug me, and we'd have like an entire week's conversation. And sometimes uh, greeting is over, and he's still going. I said, okay, so we'll catch, we'll, we'll finish right after service. He had such a gentle spirit, um, a caring heart, and that legacy is what lives on. It calls us now to carry that torch and be gentle as we speak to others and to have conversations and that small smile that he always has. It's just slight, not too much. Um, but yet you knew his presence. He served. That's something I picked up and admired um, as deacon. Depending on, regardless of his age, it seems like he had the discipline. If, I, if there was a task to be done, he was going to be there, fold the chairs. If it's one at a time, slowly, but it would be done. Amen. So uh, we appreciate his service, and I extend my condolences to his family, his wife, his children, and also the church. Before we get to the word, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity of being in your house this morning. It is always an honor and a privilege to be in the presence of the King. And so, Father, let us not take this encounter slightly, or lightly, Father. Allow us to receive all the blessings that you brought here this morning to pour on us. Hide me behind the cross, Father, so that everything I may say may be what you want your people to hear and for me to be fed by this word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our world is currently suffering from an identity crisis, if you haven't noticed. Whether it's the political arena, or families, or um, marriage, there's sort of an identity crisis. It seems roles are being reversed. Uh, the family is not looking like what it used to be. Now classrooms are presenting mom to moms to dads, and it's, it's a tough conversation for sometimes to, to deal with. And if it's not presented in the classrooms when they go to the grocery stores, children notice things. And sometimes if you have them with no filters, they say what they notice. Why is this? Why is, does this look this way? And sometimes as parents, you're cringing, but they deserve answers. Nevertheless, the world has an identity crisis. This week on social media, I believe last week, there was um, an arrest somewhere in Liverpool, Ohio. And the police captured it, and it went crazy on social media. I saw two people sitting behind a wheel, man and woman, and a child in the rear seat. But the parents were completely sort of slumped on the side, and this child, they, they blurred the vision of the child's face so you can identify it was in the back seat. And I, I was wondering, what's going on? What's behind that story? I clicked on the story, and it was about two parents. Uh, police sort of saw the car swerving, and there was a bus, a uh, school bus ahead of them, and they braked, and their heads sort of were bobbing. And as police approached the cars, the car, the parents were completely passed out because they were high on drugs. Mm -hmm. And here you have this four-year-old child now in this rear seat, taking in this scenery. And as young as that child is, trust me, it's a memory that he will have. That's sort of an identity crisis. Parents are there to take care, to protect to provide a sort of comforting and nurturing environment. And this child has this image in mind now. 
Psychologists have said, well, yeah, we can uh, adapt and do behavioral modification and treat patients that way. But really, is that the solution? Many people have come to realize also that a lot of behaviors stem on how people identify themselves. Your identity is what produces the behavior. What you think of yourself is what's producing the different behaviors. So if you don't know who you really are, if you look at what you do, it should tell you a little bit about who you are. And as we observe people, it's the same thing. An experiment was held with a group of people coming to a room and a makeup artist got them and put sort of a lot of makeup on their face. Some people had a gash with blood, other people had pimple, you know, just really outrageous um, differences made on their faces. And then they told the people, okay, look at yourself in the mirror. So they looked at themselves in the mirror. It was not the person that left home that morning. They sort of looked a little bit different. And then they told the, they told the people, okay, come back. And what they did is removed all the scars, but did not let them look at themselves in the mirror again and sent them out. And they said, when you come back, tell us how people treated you. And everyone left with the sense of identity that they still had the scars on, or the, you know, all the graphic details on their face. So automatically, they saw people looking at them strangely, even though they had nothing on their faces. They saw people moving away. They saw people not smile. They saw people just treating them differently. Why? The sense of identity that they had of them had of themselves was no longer there because it was skewed by the makeup they saw. So when they came back into the room, they said, well, how did people treat you today? People were mean to us. No one smiled. No one said hello to us. People ran away from us. They had nothing on their faces. And when they were told this, they were all surprised. The enemy is doing the same thing to us. We wake up in the morning, sometimes leave home, sometimes even without praying. And he knows this, so he begins to shift the identity that Christ has given to you. He changes that identity, and when you begin making encounters during the day, they're no longer the same. The way you think people ought to view you, they don't because the enemy has changed your identity. The enemy wants us all to suffer from a case of mistaken identity. That makes his job easier. He's working overtime to keep your identity masked, to keep you from knowing the truth about yourself. The truth being that you are alive, you are free, you are empowered by God's own spirit to fight victoriously against him. But the minute he changes your identity, he knows that you don't have that sense of victory anymore. So then, he would rather keep you in a state of grief, sadness, depression. He wants you lifeless, disengaged, brainwashed, into believing you are nothing and you have nothing to give. He works around the clock to keep us away from the word of God and prayer. Have you ever noticed sometimes you kneel to pray and you fall asleep? Or you do what I call a sightseeing prayer. You begin with request and then you end up thinking about dinner for tomorrow, laundry that has to be done, clothes that need to be folded, uh, what's on my agenda for the next day, and then you forgot. And you realize I'm still kneeling and praying. <laughs> because the enemy realized that once you fervently begin to pray, your true identity will become clear. And so to avoid that from happening, he keeps you distracted. In Paul, he writes, in Ephesians, Paul writes a colossal letter to the Ephesians. And I'm just going to go through the text. Chapter 1, he says, you are equipped through Christ with every spiritual blessing. The enemy doesn't want you to know that. He says, you are chosen in him before the foundation of the world. I think to me that baffles me. Despite my inefficiencies, my inadequacies, God has chosen me? Who am I? God has chosen you before the foundation of the world. Knowing who you're going to be, he still chooses us. Regard, regardless of everything you've done, God still chooses, chooses to look at you as holy, blameless before him the minute you ask for forgiveness. The text of meditation today reminded us that you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation,
nation, a people belonging to God. Sometimes your identity is screwed, uh, you know, screwed and skewed because you don't know who you belong to. But God makes it clear in the word, I chose you and you belong to me. Not only that, he doesn't treat you like sometimes our parents, family, church members. It doesn't matter. When you do something wrong, everyone sort of doesn't say anything and they kind of look the other way when you walk. No, God always stands with his arms wide open. The minute you walk in, in whatever condition, just come. Just come. And he says, he called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Not only that, the thing is that when we identify and connect with God, everything that he possesses is ours. Can you imagine the amount of authority you have? I can imagine, um, I remember an experience I had working at Cornell in New York at the time, and I was working at the hospital, and I was working with one of our nurses who had different views, perhaps didn't like me too much, but it didn't matter. Sometimes you walk into your office prayerfully every day, <laughs> wanting to, to maintain that, because no matter what, we have to be Christians wherever we are. Mm. And she came and made a, a little bit of a derogatory remark, and I tried to ignore it, but in my mind, I could feel beads of sweat coming down, <laughs> and it didn't feel good. And you know, sometimes the flesh wants to respond. And at that moment, I, in my mind, I said, she doesn't know whose child I am. So I called on God immediately in that moment because if I chose to spoke, speak, I might have said something that was inappropriate. Not only would I be embarrassed, but I would have embarrassed my father. That's not what he expects from us. So I prayed, didn't say anything about it. An opportunity came for me to switch departments and I really, uh, I've always enjoyed research. So I was working in electrophysiology, which is a different part of heart, and I wanted to go into interventional cardiology. And I said, oh, you know what, I'd like to switch and uh, do research in that area just so I have a better understanding. Well, you, you can't do that. I didn't say anything. I went to speak to the director of cardiology at the time. He was very welcoming, sat in my office, and I said, look, Dr. Levin, I'd love to learn more about interventional cardiology. He said, Ruth, you have my blessing. If that's what you want to do, you've been great in, uh, as part of our team, but if you want to go ahead and um, explore that, you have my blessing. So I went and I moved forward, and she said, no, you can't, you can't move. I said, oh, well, I've already spoken to Dr. Lerman, director of the department. He said, he gave you the permission to, I said, yeah. He gave me his blessing, and I'm moving on. Sometimes as a child of God, you have the greatest resource. And too many times we ignore that resource. We're begging the wrong people, asking the wrong people for favors, when all you have to do is call on your father. And it doesn't mean that you have to kneel on your knees in the office, it just means at that moment remaining quiet and sending a prayer straight to him. It doesn't matter, it's a wireless service that never drops, that never disconnects, it's always available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and guess what? Our God is a show off too. When man says no, he says, I'll show you. Since you lifted my name, I'm going to say yes, and I'm going to let them know I'm the one who says yes. So let's call on God and know who we are. As sons and daughters of the living God, we are not strategically praying enough. And we need to do that because the enemy is strategic about how he attacks us. However, if we pray, he knows he's already lost. The minute you get your knees on the ground, he's in trouble. Because he doesn't know what you're saying to your father. And he knows when you get up, you don't get up the same way. You're powerful because God stands behind you and his heavenly host of angels all are there available to you to fight your fight. He will try to downplay your strength. He will force you to hate how you look, to be jealous of your brothers and sisters. He will try to highlight your weakness, your insecurity, to always see yourself as less than. But God says, greater is he that is in me. He reminds us that than he that is in the world. When you know that you pray, understand that you are walking with God in you. Do you imagine that? He is walking in you so that as we pray for others, that power that Jesus had is also available to us. He says we will do even greater things than he did while he was on earth. Amen. The only thing that we need to do is stay connected. Amen. Remain committed to him. 
in everything. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. Lord, I'm stressed out. That's a prayer. Lord, I don't know what to do about this. Lord, my children are acting, I don't know. Lord, my marriage is in trouble. And he understands even before you say anything. And I think most of the time, God is just waiting for you to say something to him so that he can act on your behalf. If the enemy gets us to believe his lies, you won't feel equipped. You won't be able to stand up against him. So that is why you and I need to be praying daily and without ceasing to keep the truth about your identity and who you are constant and unbroken before God and before our own eyes. A story was told of an eagle who was flying and lost an egg. The egg ended up, I'm sure you probably heard it probably in different formats, the egg ended up in a chicken coop. So the hen sat, sat on the egg until it hatched. And of course, when the egg hatched, I'm sure the other chicks looked and said, that doesn't look like a, a little chicken like one of us. It's an eaglet. And so the eaglet, not knowing that he's not a chicken, began acting like the chickens. He was pecking his food. He flew only so high when he learned to fly. And one day, there was a huge shadow up in the sky flying. And the eaglet looks up and said, what is that? And it was an eagle flying ahead. But he was way up and casted a large shadow. And he wondered, wow, what bird is that? And wonder, my goodness, I would love to be like that. And so another day, eagle comes flying by and peers down and sees an eaglet amongst the chickens acting like a chicken. And the eagle says, what are you doing there? He says, what do you mean? I'm a chicken. No, you're not. You belong way up here with me flying in the sky. The enemy does the same thing to us, my brothers and sisters. God has called us a chosen people. And he makes us think that you're just a nobody. You are not chickens, you're eagles. So fly high because that's the identity your father has given to you. People will try to take it away from you. The enemy will try to doubt yourself, but imagine you have to be in the word and be able to say the word when the enemy attacks you. No, God has chosen me. It says, for God so loved the world that he paid the most expensive price, his begotten son, that I might live and have eternal life. He says, no matter what happens, even if you walk in the fire, you shall not be burned. You shall fall across the waters, but not be submerged. God has already given us everything in his word for us to live a victorious life. Above everything else, he's given us our identity. Too many times people label you with this, this and that, but God this morning is reminding, reminding us that you are part of a royal family. You are chosen. You are just not a nobody. The enemy wants you to believe that. David knew that if we look at the story of David and Goliath. If you remember, Goliath stood there for 40 days antagonizing. Antagonizing and insulting the people of God. And no one stood up to say anything. For 40 days, some bully stands there and attacks you. <coughs> Meanwhile, you serve an almighty God. He's delivered in your past, delivered you in the past, and you say nothing. Well, David said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? I admire this because David didn't take the insult on himself. He said, how dare you insult my father? Do you understand the identity, how it shifts it? Because if he says, how dare you insult me, the enemy would have won. The attention would have been on him. But he said, how dare you insult my father, the king of kings? And the people of Israel, I'm sure if they heard this, now began to sort of feel, okay, yeah, we forgot. We forgot who we were. And then he proceeded to say, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. When the enemy insults you, don't dare take the insults for yourself. You turn it to God. Just like David said, and you use the word of God. How dare you insult my father? How dare you insult the child of the king of kings? Because at that point, it's not you who's going to fight, but the king of kings is going to fight on your behalf. 
this day, David said, the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. My goodness, his life experiences brought him to that point that he could speak so strongly about who his father was. Remembering who you are is critical in winning every battle. God stands and his viewpoint about you must come first in your heart and in your mind. Don't let the world, the media, social media, or anyone define who you are, but let who God says you are be what you are. Amen. When the king of Aram in 2 King chapter 6 plotted and planned to attack Israel, Elisha's attendant woke up early in the morning, went outside, and saw an army. Can you imagine waking up and seeing like a full military squadron right outside your door? He ran back inside and said, the army's up on us. And, and knowing that, you know, where is our army, I'm sure, is what he was thinking. Elisha, cool as ever, told him, don't worry. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And I'm sure the, his attendant turned around and, and looked and said, all right, my, my, uh, my master's losing it. I don't, I don't see it. I don't see it. So Elisha didn't answer or contend with him. He, said, he just prayed, oh Lord, I pray open his eyes that he may see. And when he opened his eyes and turned, he saw a host of angels on mountains around him. When the terrified servant turned back, he saw in a spiritual reality on the mountainside full of horses and chariots. Elisha knew his identity in Christ. That's why when confronted with the impossible, he called on God immediately. Prayer made him aware that all the resources and strength and protection that God, that he needed, God had already placed there. His servant couldn't see it, but I'm sure Elijah had a feeling, God, I know you got this. Can you imagine when you're faced going to work with dealing with difficult colleagues and dealing with difficult bosses and dealing with difficult parents maybe at different schools? It doesn't matter. They don't see what you see. But you can't lose sight of God because otherwise you lose sight of what you need to see also. At that moment, you say, you have to say sometimes to yourself, Lord, open my eyes so that I know that you are here with me and we are going to be okay because we're going to win this battle. So let us stop living in a state of defeat. Let us stop letting the enemy create our identity. Let us stop surrendering to any insecurities and the spirit of defeat and depression that the enemy is trying to place on you. Let us instead know that no matter what is against us, it is no match for the power and the authority we have in God. God has given us access to his power, the power of prayer. The minute you call on your father, he is present even before you call. There may be armies standing against you, but they are only there waiting to see the glory of God. <laughs> My struggle is the same as yours. The enemy has been telling us too long that we are no good. We're washed up. We're under-equipped. We're incompetent. We're insignificant. We're unlovable. We're not quite up to par, but no more. We're serving him notice today, for we know, according to Matthew 25, 34, we are loved by God even before time began. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we are endowed with the eternal spirit of God. Deuteronomy 28, verse 13, we are the head, not the tail. We are above, never beneath, and like Matthew likes to say, we are conquerors, conquerors. Conquerors, Isaiah 49, 16, he has engraved you in the palm of his hand. Engraved, so how can he forget you? He cannot forget you. Jeremiah tells us, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Romans 8 tells you, nothing can ever separate you from his love. Not death, not life, not angels, not demons, not fear of today, nor worries of tomorrow, not even powers of can separate us from the love of God. Nothing in all creation can separate you from his love. 
First Peter 2 verse 9 tells us you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. If you didn't know it this morning, my brothers and sisters, it should allow you to stand a little taller and be able to look at any enemy in the eyes and tell them, you're not going to mess with me today. My father is the king of kings. And if you mess with me, I won't be the one you have to contend with. But he will fight all my battles for me. Not only that, we know we serve a God who's won every battle he's never lost. So the enemy will begin shaking. And if he tries and he tries to attempt to attack us, don't worry about it. God's got you. He's going to blow him away. So next time the enemy steps your way, give him notice. Give him notice. Don't come this way if you don't want to lose. Because the minute you attack me, you are attacking my father. And my father never loses a battle. 